Good evening and welcome to Navigating Truth in a Changing Media Landscape. It's a presentation of the Connecticut Mirror, and it's presented in partnership with the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut. I'm John Dankosky, your host. We're recording this not only for our podcast, Steady Habits, but also for future use on our events page. And before we get started, I just want to direct you to ctmirror.org slash events, because not only can you see a number of really interesting conversations that we've had in the past, including one that we worked on with the folks at the foundation called Growing Connecticut's Economy Through Inclusion, but you can also find out about an event that we've got coming up next week. Linda Greenhouse joins us once again. She talked to us last year at the end of the Supreme Court term. She's, of course, the longtime New York Times reporter on the Supreme Court, and she will be sitting down with us next Tuesday at this time to talk about the Supreme Court term. You can join us once again at ctmirror.org slash events. Please sign up in advance. So again, this conversation started with the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut. We've done events with them in the past. And as we were talking about doing an event like this in the future, we started kicking around ideas. And so much of the idea of truth in the media and truth just in America right now is so up in the air. The question is, where is the truth? For, for those of us who grew up in the 1970s, like I did, the truth was what we saw reported on our nightly news and in our newspapers of record. But as we know, those things don't really exist anymore, at least as, as they were. They've been replaced by a dizzying number of sources directly sharing their thoughts and their feelings, sometimes their conspiracy theories, and yeah, quite a bit, they also share real news on a second-by-second -second basis. So how do we tell fact from fiction? And how do we assess the news that we consume? And how do we tell news consumers how to ask better questions, how to learn how to be better news consumers? These are some of the questions that we're going to be talking with our panelists about. And I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. But I do want to let you know that many of you have been on Zoom maybe all day today or maybe several times over the course of the last year or so. If you have questions for our panel, you can go down to the bottom of your screen and just click on the Q&A function. That's a good place to put your question. We will also have a chat open so that you can have a dialogue back and forth with other folks who are taking part in this conversation. But if you want to get a question to me to ask our panelists, please use the Q&A function. That'll really help. Thank you. Our panelists are John Silva. He's Senior Director of Education and Training at the News Literacy Project. He joined uh, the project back in 2017. He had 13 years of experience as a middle and high school uh, social studies teacher with the Chicago Public Schools. He first became involved with news literacy back in 2014 when his students engaged in a classroom program with NLP. He's a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, and he spent several years in corporate telecommunications before deciding to become a teacher. John Silva, welcome to our program. Thanks so much for being here. Marie Shanahan is here. She's Associate Professor of Journalism and Associate Department Head of Journalism at the University of Connecticut. She has been teaching journalism at UConn for years. Her academic research and teaching focus is on the intersection of journalism and digital communication technology. She studies trends in digital discourse, online commenting on news sites and on social media, online reputation and local news engagement. She is a board member of the Connecticut Mirror, and she's a longtime reporter at the Hartford Current and other publications. Welcome, Marie. Thanks so much for being here. And Sassi Larinietta is managing editor of The Day in New London. She moved to Connecticut back in 1999 to start working for The Day as a town reporter. During her tenure, she's covered several beats, including courts, police, and breaking news. She's covered critical issues like eminent domain in New London, the state's last death penalty execution, and uncovered uh, and wrote about a mortgage scam that led to two high-profile federal convictions. Sassy, welcome. Thanks so much for being here as well. Uh, we have one person who straddles the line between education and journalism. We have a journalist here, and we have someone who is firmly planted in education. And, and I really want to start on the journalism end of things, uh, Sassy, and start with you. One of the things that we're trying to discuss here tonight is the historic journalistic role of, of checks and balances, of checking sources, of doing the work of journalism right. So before we delve into uh, separating truth that people might hear from fiction that they might hear, maybe we can talk a little bit about the work 
that reporters do today and how they do it. What do you tell your reporters when they go out the door to tell a story, especially young reporters, about how best to do that news so that the people who are reading it can believe what they read? Well, that's a, a good question. A lot really hasn't changed. It's just how we deliver the message that's a little different. Um, when I first started out, social media didn't really exist. It was just starting the internet, you know, was a fairly new concept. When I tell young reporters, I always encourage them, you can maybe use, you know, Facebook or Instagram or, or whatever to maybe find contacts. But the best way to do it is to go in person, to knock on some doors. Um, don't believe everything you see on their internet. You have to verify that from yourself. What, where did that information come from? Who was the source? Be critical, be critical, be criti critical. There's also now this sense of urgency where there's competition, right? So, oh, we have to beat the current or we have to beat the bulletin. But I always tell them, I'd rather be, you know, accurate than first. So it's so important to double check, triple check your information before you feed that out. Reporters, when I was started out, we worked for prints, right? It was print deadline. And then later on, you post something on, on, the, on our day.com. Now it's the opposite. It's digital first. So we have to get that information out. But it's not posted unless it's accurate, unless it's confirmed, either by an official source or by witnessing with your own eyes. So in many respects, you know, it's how we deliver it. But the tactics of getting the information, that really hasn't changed. It's interesting, this idea of, of confirming something, because I think a lot of people who don't understand the way the media works and don't trust the way reporters do what they do, they don't understand a lot of the ins and outs. Can you talk, Sassy, a little bit more about, about that idea, about what reporters are expected to do to actually confirm that something is true? Sure. For, we get tips all the time. Um, does that mean we put, put it out there before confirming them? Absolutely not. So let's say, for example, we got a tip that there was a a crime, for example, at a, a local restaurant. I'm just throwing it out there. We don't put that on, on the website. We either go to the scene, verify for ourselves, talk to an official at the scene, whether it be police officer or your first electman. And then once we confirm something, then we will write about it. Just because you know we get a tip or we hear something, that doesn't make you accurate. You have to verify it for yourself. And that can be going in person, or talking to the official, your that you know that representative who can speak to the, the truthfulness of that scenario that you're trying to cover, and that's the frustrating part because sometimes, well, we get calls saying, "Oh, you didn't write about this." Well, it's because it wasn't true or it wasn't exactly as reported. So that's the you know the frustration that we get that we're trying to cover something up, but the reality is that the tip that we got just wasn't accurate, and we can't put it out there. Now, Marie, this is the same newspaper culture that, that you grew up in as a reporter. So this is the way that you understand how, how to do the work. One of the things that's fascinating, though, from, from the perspective of many people I talk to who are not part of the news media, they say, well, let's just listen to what Sassy said. Um, we're going to talk to an official source. Well, an official source like the police, they have you know, maybe a bone to pick with someone. Maybe they've got a point of view to get across. Maybe the police are telling the truth, but they're only telling you so much of the truth. And the, the question always comes in that even if you check your sources, you get two sources, five sources, 10 sources, each one of those sources actually has their own story to tell. And because of the nature of social media, almost all of us are really a lot better than we used to be at spinning our own yarn, at telling our own story. So, so how, when you're teaching journalism, do you teach people to figure out all of those things and turn it into a story that people can truly believe? Well, a part of it, and I'm sure that Sassy's reporters do the same thing. Like you're not, yes, you go get the official source, but you shouldn't privilege the officials over someone else who may have been an eyewitness, who may be directly affected by the story. Um, so making sure that you have that balance of perspectives as well um, is, what, is, is part of it. Um, but the other thing that, that I think journalists, you know, this is what I teach my students as well, is that obviously Sassy talks about getting a lot of tips. So journalists are well known to certain actors that if they wanna get their side of the story out there, 
um, that they will go, you know, they will approach them. They will send them, you know, tips on, you know, using DMs on Twitter. Um, and so it's that idea of they're coming after you and you have to question, okay, what is this person's motivation for wanting me to know this information? Because everyone has a bias. Everyone has, you know, they want the story written a certain way. And, and it's the job of the journalist to make sure that, yeah, maybe you understand where they're coming from, but you sort of take that emotion out of it and go talk to some other people. So, and that's so, really, you know, in terms of the news, you got to take the emotion part out of it. But, but, but the context is so incredibly important. And the things that we're, we're creating for people to consume are, are so much shorter, so much briefer than, than they used to be. So if, if you say, Marie, that, you know, everyone has, has a motivation behind what they say in a, in a short news story that someone's going to put out very quickly digitally, they're not going to be able to say, I talked to such and such, but as everyone knows, he ran for city council against this other person. And that's why he might have a bone to pick, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost hard to get all the context you'd need in there. So how much is on the reporter and the editor and how much is on the consumer themselves to really know some of this stuff and know some of this context before they read a story? Right. Well, I would argue that a lot of it is also on the design of the news package that is put out there. So on a digital story, like the day has a website, is that, all right, maybe the reporter writes a story and it doesn't have every single detail, but there's no reason that you can't have a hyperlink if the day's been covering the story for a long time and they wrote about, you know, that town councilman and how he works at this particular company. It's not like you can't link to that story. Or I was just reading earlier today, um, Stanford, uh, some professors at Stanford put out this playbook about how to deal with disinformation and misinformation. And one thing that they were talking about is as part of the design to put something out there. So like when, when they figured out it was the Russians who were leaking information from, you know, Podesta's account or whatever that was, making sure that that's where the information came from and making that basically a sign on every story. So yes, maybe the information was true, but this is how it was obtained and this is where it came from. And we're not gonna actually link to it, but we're gonna make it available and try and explain it to you in context. The context part, John, that you talked about is really important because it's so easy for someone to just take one quote, strip it out, stick it on Twitter, and then the whole context of the story takes on a different point of view. Um, and we know that this is this is what happens. You know, you take your little sound bite, and then suddenly the thing grows into something which it wasn't at all. Um, and and that's some of the danger of digital media. But I think in some ways we can try and fight that with with better design. So John, I want to bring you into this. How does this idea of of context resonate with you in the work that you do in trying to educate people to be good news consumers? Well, one of the interesting things is that false context is one of the most common types of misinformation out there. Um, when you look at sort of what, you know, what misinformation looks like um, and it's, it's, it's rampant. Um, you know, one really common example is um, how often people will take a fake screenshot from a satirical article and post it as if it's a real screenshot. There was an example from the, uh, the Babylon Bee where they had a fake CNN screenshot and a, and a fake Chiron. And so they just took, took it out of the satirical context published it as if it was a real CNN uh, screenshot and that created this false context misinformation. So that's actually one of the things that we do try to teach um, when we're talking about types of misinformation is that you, know, you have to kind of look at who's posting it, where it's from, digging deeper, trying to learn more of that context because it's very easy to take, take you know, a selective, you know, just one snippet of a longer video, uh, taking one part of a quote or even just taking an image and, and changing its caption. It's very common. But, but, but for the most part, when someone who might be confused by something sees that screenshot, it's not coming from the original source that's posted it. Mm -hmm. It's somebody who they trust who's reposting it on Facebook and Twitter. And that's really the, that's the problem, isn't it, John? The, this idea that you don't necessarily even know where this thing started but grandma posted it and God, grandma's got no reason to tell me a lie. Well, so that's, that's the other, the other interesting part of this, you know, when we, when we talk about what, you know, what we trust, what, what we look at, you know, one thing that's, the, one thing that's important for us to remember, and, and we, we try to teach about this is the power of confirmation bias, right? If you see something that confirms something you already believe, and maybe you're, you're seeing it 
you know, from that, from a source that continually shares it with you, or it's in an echo chamber of a social media group, right? You're likely to believe it without questioning. And that's where this edu that's where the education piece comes into this conversation so importantly is that, you know, we need to teach young people how to take personal responsibility for their, their information feeds, how to know, how to know when and how to verify information from themselves. Um, because that's, that's one of the ways that we're going to solve a lot of these challenges of misinformation is by showing people the, the warning signs and, and, and knowing that it's up to us to sort of figure out if it's, if it's something we should trust and whether or not we should share it and act on it. I want to get deeply into some of the, the education pieces of this in, in just a little bit, okay. John, but I, I do want to ask you, in the work that you do trying to educate folks around this issue, how much do you think people understand about what Marie and Sassy were talking about, the way that journalists do their work, the difference between the work of a journalist trying to suss out as close as we can to the truth versus people just making stuff up? There's a major knowledge gap in there in, in, in several really important ways. Um, one of the most important, and this, is, this, this I think is one of the big challenges is that um, a lot of people, a lot of adults, especially a lot of young people, um, don't necessarily always recognize the differences between news and opinion. Um, and there's so much opinion and commentary content out there. So much of what we're seeing, on, especially on our social media feeds is not you know, a, a verified news report following the standards of quality journalism from a reporter who's checked their sources, verified all those, you know, done all those things. A lot of it's just people telling us what they think and trying to be persuasive. So that's that's actually a really important part. But then, yeah, there is there is a big gap because, in in a way, when you when you talk about like if, if you ask people who are you know who are the reporters that you listen to or that you most commonly think about chances are they're going to name columnists and commentators and opinion writers they're not going to they're not going to name um, a journalist who's you know doing straight news it's interesting a great example of this here in Chicago um, a lot of veteran uh, journalists from the Chicago Tribune are leaving after there's a there's a buyout happening at the paper um, and there's a lot of sort of a lot of people are, are very upset about some prominent names that are leaving and the ones that people are upset about are columnists and we're not talking about the journalists. That's that's the interesting thing. And so we're trying to, in our education piece, we're trying to sort of pull back the curtain and work with journalists and news organizations to say, hey, there's a lot that goes into quality reporting of, of news and, and, the, and those standards of quality journalism. And so it's it's a it is a major challenge. Hey, and Sassy, this has got to be something that that probably plagues you in your newsroom all the time, right? You have a traditional newspaper model that has a newsroom going out there and reporting stories in just the way that you talked about. You also have columnists, you have an op-ed page, people are writing in letters to the editor, and you have editorial pieces that come from essentially the masthead of the paper. It's, it's when the day says, we are going to uh, endorse such and such a candidate, or we think that you should vote yes or no on such and such um, uh, a bill. That's something that I think confuses people an awful lot. And I guess I'm wondering from someone in the newsroom piece of this, how difficult that is and whether or not that's something that maybe needs to change at the traditional newspaper level in order for people to fully grasp what it is the heck you're doing. It's funny, John, that you say this because we've had this conversation probably two weeks ago. Um, we get a lot of questions from people uh, on this. Uh, the day actually formed a trust committee we are working with the Trusting News Project to tackle those very issues. We make it very clear when a piece is opinion, when it's the edit editorial, we let people know who's a part of that editorial team. And we try to distinguish that from the news. Clear la labeling and messaging, we hope helps. We also, you know, uh, have um, share how we get the stories, the stories behind the stories. We wanna disclose, take the veil off as much as possible um, how the news gets reported. Um, we have our audience engagement editor has a, a podcast specifically for that. It's called The Storyline that takes a topic and, and has a one-on-one -on -one with the reporter to see how that story was formed. We had one recently on the critical race theory, which obviously was is a national hot topic. She had the reporter on to talk about how she came about this that story, how she found her sources, 
how she made a concerted effort to include all voices from pro and against the teaching of this in schools. It's one of the biggest issues that has we have. We get complaints of how can a reporter, you know, cover this race if they just supported this candidate? And we, the poor reporter has to say, no, 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 that's not us. That's the editorial. We don't take sides. We want to hear from you. It's a challenge, but we feel that by explaining that, we also have an FAQ on our website that sort of helps people, you know, just let us know how we report, who does what. I think the key is providing information and clear labeling of the messages and the stories. It is something that we constantly battle. And it is confusing and I get it, it yeah. is confusing. And I guess I wonder, Marie, in, in your ideas, you know, stepping back from working in newspapers every day and being in academia and getting a chance to think about, okay, how, how does this work, this model that I worked in for such a long time and how could it work better? What do you think about that, that piece of it? Does the traditional newspaper model in some ways hold people back because, as Essie just said, it confuses people, maybe unnecessarily. Well, it, it may be, you know, there's a report that just came out last week by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in Oxford, and it, was, it wasn't it was very promising because it said that the U.S. basically ranks last in media trust. Um, and that's, you know, one thing is that everyone lumps the media all together. Like, what's the media? It's not just the day. It's also NBC. It's CNN. It's Fox News. Like, everyone's getting lumped together. So trust is also part of familiarity. And a lot of people don't, are not going to the day's homepage to get their news. They go to Facebook first. They go to Twitter first. They go to Instagram first. They go to TikTok first. So their, their points of contact with the day may be more, more minimal than they used to be. And so all news organizations are basically dealing with this where consumers are not as familiar with their products anymore. So if the one time they click, you know, they click on something and it's an opinion article and they don't realize that it's an opinion article because the design, it's designed poorly and it's not labeled, then suddenly, you know, you have, you have that sort of gets lumped right into it. And so the trust piece is important. It's something that I think about a lot too, because how do we, there's so much mistrust right now in institutions in the United States, democratic institutions, including the media. And so what do we do to build some of that back when the rhetoric and, and the way social media and how we communicate today is designed to basically polarize us and strip away all of that trust so we don't even know what to believe. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people who are trying to fight this good fight out there, and it's a hard one. Um, but, but trust is definitely a problem. John, can you pick up on that, this, this idea of trust and how much people actually trust the media whatever they call the media or whatever they think the media is? Well, I think in just in general, there is, there's a great, we have, we have an institutional cynicism problem in the United States today in, in a lot of very important ways and the media being one of those institutions. Um, and in particular, you know, this is something that's been percolating for several years where, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of misinformation, a lot of conspiracy theories, sort of uh, blame, you know, the media, the mainstream media, however they want to frame it as being complicit in a lot of a, a lot of these these conspiracies and, and a lot of the political misinformation. Um, and in a way, I think a lot of people have allowed their sort of preferred sources of news and information to become part of their not only their belief systems, but also their identities. Right. Um, because the things that they believe in are being reinforced by certain sources of information. So it's, it's really contributing a lot to those divisions and in some ways even the tribalism that people you know, will only trust from, they will only trust from sources that, that aren't going to challenge what they believe because a lot of people just want that comfort of that constant reinforcement of those echo chambers. What's interesting about the echo chamber conversation is that I, I hear from a lot of people who I think firmly believe themselves to be somewhere in the middle. They really want to understand many sides of an issue. They want to understand um, all different types of people's opinions. And what I hear often, John, is, well, for me to get the full story, I, I, I need to go to Fox and MSNBC. I need to go to the liberal newspaper and the conservative newspaper in town. I need to hear these, these various points of view. But an awful lot of what what you do, the work that you do, the work that frankly all of us ha have done has sort of shown that 
there's a difference between um, different points of view and some people just making stuff up and other people getting getting the story right. I guess I wonder how, how damaging you think that idea is of just saying, well, I'll sample everything and then I'll make up my mind based on this wide variety of information that I'm getting from various sources. I think it depends greatly on how you start um, because the unfortunate thing is that a lot of people go through a process that resembles motivated reasoning more than critical thinking. Mm. Um, and by that, I mean, um, if, if, some, if you start your search and you start to look at information because you are trying to prove or do, you're trying to prove a certain point, right? That's not critical thinking, that's motivated reasoning. Um, and the unfortunate thing is like a lot of people, you know, when they, when people say, I'm going to do my research, you know, it's, it's really a, a, a process that's just rife with cognitive biases. Um, and then I think one of the other, one of the other big challenges of, of a lot of this is, and this is, this is not something that's new. This, this has been going on for a very long time is that, um, we've lost the capacity for discourse in a lot of important ways. Everything is really framed as a debate. Um, and, and, in really in problematic ways is like, as in, in binary debates, it's, it's one or the other when so many of the issues that we're trying to discuss and, and learn about and, and the policies that we want to enact, like there's, there's a spectrum, but the unfortunate thing is that, is, is that so much of the way we perceive sources of news and information fall in that binary liberal or conservative spectrum. And so that's, that's an issue. That's one of the things that it's, it's not a direct skill that we try to teach. But when we work with educators and, we, and we're trying to say, if you're gonna talk about current events, if you're gonna bring controversial issues into your classroom, uh, you have to set up ground rules for discourse. So this is gonna be an exchange of ideas where we're gonna to try to learn as much as we can. It's not about, this is not a debate where one side's gonna win and the other side's gonna lose. It's a, it's a huge challenge, not just in education, but everywhere. Marie, I'd love for you to pick up on this. A large part of your scholarship has really been about this discourse. And I think we all, however many years ago, 10, 15, maybe it was years ago, we all thought that the internet's going to be wonderful for discourse. We're going to be able to have these high level conversations. And then all you have to do is read the series of comments after a, a story on the Hartford Current. You think, my God, we're the, like the, the human race shouldn't exist. I mean, we're just terrible at talking to one another or doing anything. How did it get so bad, first of all? And, and is there any place for um, the internet to, to be the type of discourse that maybe all of us imagined it could have been at the start at the start of things? Yeah, I mean, you know, John, that I've been studying online comments for a while since I was an online producer at the Harvard Current and they cause me headaches every day. And really, again, I mean, I will argue that the design of online comments does not make room for listening. It's, it's basically what John said, like, it's just a debate. Everyone is trying to win. You want to get, you want to be the first one to respond to the tweet. You want to be the funniest. You want to be the, the snarkiest. You want to get the most attention. And then, so you're not actually driven by trying to listen or change someone else's mind. You're just trying to get as much attention as possible and perhaps control, control the perspective. Um, and I have not, I have not seen a platform yet that, uh, that can do that well unless it is heavily moderated, which then raises concerns about people's free speech. And a lot of news sites, and, I, and, I don't, and Seth, you have to tell me whether or not the day still has comments, but a lot of them have, been, have done away with comments where the comment streams really are just what you're seeing on Facebook, on Twitter, um, unless it is someone's job. And I feel bad for that person who will have to actually moderate the comments so that they stay on point. I mean, John, you, you know, you hosted a talk show, you know, when callers call in, if they go off the rails, you cut them off. It's hard to do that online. You know, it's not, it, you can't necessarily respond immediately. But, but, but one of the things, Sassy, that, you know, when you host a public radio talk show, you, people have to call up, they have to get through a screener and they have to, I don't know, be tough enough to actually get on and say the thing that they're going to say. You don't have to do that when you hide behind the anonymity of, of commenting on a story. How have you folks handled that at the day over the course of time? And how do you, I don't know, how do you think about that in the context of uh, a media model that actually gives advantage to engagement? You know, the more that people comment, the more that people share, 
the better it is for your publication. So how do you thread that needle, Sassy? Honestly, we're still trying to figure it out. That's the, that's the truth of it, right? We have gotten rid of anonymous comments. So if you're going to make that comment, and if you're going to say something outrageous, you're going to have to use your name. So we do have a system in place where anonymous comments has been eliminated, which has greatly reduced the comments that are just so far fetched and so hurtful and hateful and racist and anything else is that you can think of. So that has helped somewhat. Um, we can't monitor all the, all the comments. Let's just be honest. We just don't have a mechanism set up for that. But we do go in there every once in a while and look if there's something reported. We look at it to see if we have to take it off. If there's something that's something we try to engage, one way to create an engaging community within the comments is sometimes an editor will pop in and, you know, talk about the topic, keep the discourse going, maybe a little friendly reminder, say, hey, don't get too off topic, guys. Let's stick to this, you know, what the topic is about. But honestly, newspapers, not just mine, are struggling to see what the benefit is. We were hoping when it first started that it would create this community, right? A community where they can share their ideas in a robust and respectful fashion. Um, the experiment, unfortunately, isn't working the way that we thought it would. But I think, you know, for us at the day, when people started ha to have to use their names, it has toned down the hateful comments. You sure, have to back John, it up. You got to expose yourself yeah. now, right? Before, when you're anonymous, you could get away yeah. with anything. But now you have to expose yourself. John, I, I'm wondering about, about this, though. The, the, this, this idea of having this robust online conversation do you think that we became worse at talking to one another and being respectful to one another because of the platforms that we have in front of us of social media? Or do you think that we were just a society heading there already and this just amplifies things? I mean, where does the problem lie here? Uh, it's only one place. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think that there is there is definitely an issue with on with generally with online spaces in the in the sense that um, the ability to uh, post things whether anonymously or not um, people people will say things in an online space that they would never say uh, or not would say never would they generally wouldn't say in person right uh, being able to post things online. Um, frees people from a lot of those sort of social restrictions that we would have if we were if we were talking face to face. Um, I mean, we see that in, in across social media platforms. You know, we see that in in, in schools that you know are dealing with bullying issues. Right, um, kids are being bullied in ways that we you know we never anticipated, and it because it's because kids are able to you know share things in online spaces where they feel that there's there's just there are no repercussions. And in a sense, the, the only repercussions that are out there, and well, well, schools are an exception, but just, you know, when we talk about the general public, the only repercussions really are is if if there's sort of uh, a so you know a, a backlash in whatever whatever context that you're sharing things in, uh, if people are holding each other accountable. But the reality is, like most people can just you know they just feel free to to say those things, no matter how shocking or hurtful or hateful they, they may be. And, and there's a lot of it out there. Yeah, we, we, we all thought that the the only way to police this is is public shaming of bad actors. We would we would make sure that people who treated other people badly online would not be able to get away with such a thing. And then we elected a president who made a career out of doing exactly that thing. And it seems as though, to a certain extent, we we want we want that we must want that as a society because we have continually come back to it. It actually gets to a question here that Nicholas uh, wrote for us. It says, while much of social media is one-sided opinion sharing rather than genuine discourse, and since most conversations are happening digitally now, and since we as people are so averse to being perceived wrong, what is the solution? How do we increase genuine discourse in our lives? I don't know, Marie, that's a really big, that's a big, bigger question than even for, for this media panel. But but how do you address Nicholas? I mean, that is a big question. And it's this idea of like, how do we become better listeners where you're not just 
thinking of the snarky response to get everyone's attention, but I actually heard what you said and internalized it. I thought about it, like well, like we hope people do with a good news story, and then actually think about it and 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 discuss it like that. So you know, I think that comments probably is not the online comments is not the place where listening is going to happen, but maybe more community events where you actually get people together and have them take turns listening to each other, um, especially people from different points of view. Um, and maybe all of us as journalists and as educators, we have to all learn to be moderators like you, John Dankosky, and bring people together, ask them thoughtful questions, hear what they say, and see if we can draw something out and see, find the commonalities, find the places where we might actually agree on something and also agree to disagree without personally attacking each other. It, it, Sassy, I'd love to hear how the day has been thinking about this, because I, I will tell you, I was part of a project um, leading up to the 2020 election called America Amplified. And the entire idea of America Amplified was we were going to put together all of these amazing conversations in which people from different backgrounds were going to sit down in, in rooms together, but then maybe be piped to other places where they would uh, connect with people across the country who maybe have different backgrounds. And we were going to have all these public conversations. And then the pandemic hit, and and no one could do any of those things in person anymore. And I guess I'm wondering how the day has been thinking about that, about whether or not one way to get that discourse that Nicholas is asking for is just to get people actually in the room together so that they can so they can see each other. This is just so timely because you know I'm part of the trust committee. Um, Peter Hoppe, our director of uh, videography, is the chairman of that. Um, we are actually. In, in an effort to to let the you know you build trust by letting people know who is covering your news right so what we are planning to do is actually host community events uh, uh one of the commenters we have like a, a dedicated group of commenters wants us to help facilitate an event where they can all the commenters can get along and, and talk in a respectful fashion and so we're going to help them do that because it's about listening engaging with each other understanding each other's perspectives but you know as, as the paper itself we are going to host events where you know at a coffee shop one day one day it'll be at a pizza place just to get to know and talk what are your concerns what are your issues what do you want to see more about us it's about the exchange and hopefully people having people connect with one another as well um what i'm learning from all this especially you know being in lockdown is that people want to be listened to, they want to be acknowledged, and they want to feel validated. You don't necessarily have to agree with their opinion, but they want to be heard. And that's what we are trying to do at the day is to listen to people and, you know, and just say, we're trying our best. And we, we, what people sometimes forget is that we're journalists, but we're also human. So we are trying our best to cover the things that you care about, because you know what, we care about it too. And we're human. Sometimes we make mistakes. And you know what? We fess up to them. We correct them immediately. We acknowledge them. But sometimes, you know, people forget about that, that, that human component from us. John, you've, you've done a lot of this work. I mean, how do, you, how do you think we can get people together to actually suss out the truth, listen to each other in a respectful way? What are some, what are some tips that, that, that you have for that? Um, I think from from for an from an individual standpoint, um, I think I think we all need to sort of take a step back and look very closely at at how we are using social media and our sort of mass communication applications, right? You know, looking at what groups that we're members of, looking at who we follow, who's following us, who we're friends with, um, and looking for evidence that we have created um, a filter bubble for ourselves or an echo chamber. Um, and if, it, if there's an issue that we care about, we should try to, to figure out a way to contribute to discussions about that issue in ways that are productive with people who are also open to talking about these things. You know, the challenge is if we're just throwing things out into the ether of social media, Right? We're not really contributing to anything in a meaningful way. We're just, we're just throwing out ideas. Um, and I think that there, there are ways that we can create um, discussion groups um, using technology, using social media even. Um, but the challenge is, is that making sure that we're doing it in a, in a deliberate sort of thoughtful way instead of just 
you know, adding a comment at the bottom of an article. Um, you know, that this is this is one of the this is one of the challenges, right? And when I anytime we talk about like how we talk in these groups, I, I always remember um, Godwin's Law. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Godwin's Law, but it, it was it, from 1990. Godwin's Law basically says um, the longer a discussion goes on in an internet forum of one kind or another, the longer that discussion goes on, the greater the likelihood that someone will invoke Nazis or Hitler. Um, it's just it that's and it's it's true. It's still very true, and you you can you see how. But the thing is, like the longer those those types of un unchecked and and just and and free form conversations go, they just degenerate because because people aren't really trying to to talk about it. So that's that's a big challenge. It is is I think being honest about how we are personally using these these platforms and applications and and what we're actually trying to contribute to it. Um, we have a couple more questions here I, I want to get to. And again, if you have questions for our panelists, I, I would encourage you to go to the Q&A function. I'll be able to see them more quickly and we can get to them. Um, you've spoken about, this has come from Susan. Uh, you've spoken about efforts to teach students about how to verify news, understand context and sources. Are these efforts happening widely across the country or is this still a new and growing effort? Are state boards of education including this as part of curriculum standards, John? Um, so the News Literacy Project's been around for a little over 13 years. Um, our Checkology Virtual Classroom, which is our online learning platform, has been online for a little over five. Um, we are in every state in the United States, and we're in a number of countries. Um, and it's this is something where a number of school districts have adopted our programs and are adopting News Literacy. Um, we are seeing News Literacy uh, adopted generally as part of civics standards in several states. As, they, as states are trying to update, um, in many cases, some very archaic civic education standards. Um, but this is, this is also part of what we do at the News Literacy Project is, is outreach and awareness to talk about the need for news literacy, news literacy education. And you know, a lot of our support does come from the, does from the classroom up. Teachers find our resources and they share it. And then we, we, you know, we provide these resources completely free of charge. Um, we do our own professional learning events, and as we as we continue to do this, you know, we're growing things, and we're even building a network of educators, where we're trying to create an online collaborative space called News Lit Nation, where educators are coming together to share best practices and, and really uh, become ambassadors for this type of education. And Marie, is this something that you're seeing more of? As I mean, as you talk with uh, your colleagues around the country, is this something that's that's happening at the university level too? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I want to give a shout out to librarians because they're really big at teaching, you know, critical thinking and how to do good research and how to question your sources. I love uh, librarians. Yes, <laughs> librarians are great. And so, you know, definitely on the college level too. I mean, I was part of a committee where we talked about adding more gen ed courses specifically about information literacy, digital, digital literacy and news literacy. Um, and that all our, all our freshmen coming into University of Connecticut should be getting that. If not within their gen ed courses, then do, should we make a whole separate course that's just all about that, that everyone has to take. So, you know, sort of different approaches. Obviously, if you're a journalism major at UConn, you're gonna get run through the ringer where you're gonna verify everything and we're gonna teach you how to do that offline and online. Um, but it has to go beyond just the journalism students because like what John said, we all have to become better, better consumers of information because there's such a torrent of it nowadays and we have to become more responsible about what, also what we're putting out there. I like what John said about thinking about how we use social media. And one thing that I tell my journalism students at UConn, you know, they follow a whole bunch of, you know, different, you know, accounts on Twitter, usually based upon the things that they're interested in, the things they have an affinity for, the things that they like. And I always tell them, now go find a bunch of accounts that have the opposite point of view and make a list of those and look at those once a day because make sure that you are looking at all points of view and not just the one that you agree with. Not just the one that you agree with, but it gets back to a question that I, that I had before. And I just want to make a, a, a finer point on this. Sometimes the people who don't agree with the things that you agree with are saying things that aren't just of a different opinion. They're just like literally not true. Some of the things that you believe might not be true. And that's a, that, but that's a real distinction there. And it's hard, I think probably Marie, for some of your students to figure out, okay, 
what's an example of someone who doesn't agree with me necessarily politically, but but is telling the truth, as opposed to someone who doesn't agree with me politically and is just spewing a bunch of nonsense. Right, or completely out there, or conspiracy theories, or has clearly been, you know, gotten the, like, giving a lot of attention to propaganda and parroting it back out again. Those, I mean, those are all things that you need to be aware of. And you, I think it's really important also for those of us, like, if you see something and you know that it's wrong, like, don't let it sit out there and fester. Like, we all have a personal responsibility to keep the record straight. And that can be really hard. Like I have a big family Facebook, private Facebook group. And sometimes my elder relatives will post stuff on there that is blatantly untrue. And it's an awkward thing to have to do to tell my aunts and uncles like, you know, auntie, that's not true. Like here, and then I'll give them evidence because I'm a good journalist. Here is what's actually happening. You know, like you can't cure COVID by drinking garlic juice. Like that's not what's gonna do it. So things like that, you, it's all of our responsibility to put that out there. Hmm. And, and Sassy, what do you think the, the responsibility of the newspaper is to, to, to make us better news consumers? We have to continue to do our work and provide accurate information. We have to continue to gain trust in our readers. We just have to, have to, have to present both sides of the story. And we just can't, can, you know, publish something that's, we know that's not accurate. We can't continue. A lot of especially TV broadcast sites will put something out there just for the sake of doing it. We can't participate in that at the newspaper. We can only publish something that we have verified or other reputable news sources have um, verified as well. What I've learned is you can, if someone believes something, they're gonna believe it. And it's very, very, very hard to change their mind. You can present them with facts, you can present them with opposing you know, views, um, but if they believe it, they're gonna believe it. Um, going back to Marie's point, you know, I tell people to go to, if, if you don't believe the day newspaper, well then you know what, do some research on your own. Go to factcheck.org, go to PolitiFact, go to these reputable sources that fact check. And sometimes you will change someone's opinion and sometimes they will say, well, that source is biased as well. So all we can do is, you know, make sure that we are, you know, going to sources that are reputable, that understand the topic, to go to people, provide context, and hopefully we provide that information, deliver that information in a way that's understandable as well. Sassy, I do want to ask you, though, and, and follow up on something you said earlier uh, about a conversation that, that one of your reporters was having on a podcast about critical race theory. And it's sort of critical race theory is to 2021 what QAnon was to 2020, perhaps different things. But, but the idea is that through different media circles and individual sources, there is a an idea floating around amongst a fairly substantial part of the American public that there is some alternate version of American history that is being taught in schools that, and I'll do air quotes, even though some people might be listening to this, that indoctrinates young people into a certain un-American way of thinking. Okay. So there's some things about that to, to pull apart, but how do you as a newspaper think about the way to cover something like that when at a school board meeting in Waterford, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have somebody coming up to you and saying, well, you know, we need to make sure we're not teaching critical race theory to our, to our eighth graders. How exactly do you handle dealing with something like that? Well, we've had that in, um, Olam and East Lime. So you're just two towns over. Cause we've Sorry, had Waterford. I apologize. <laughs> We've had that. We've had those exact scenarios. What is the task of the reporter? The task of the reporter is to explain, not take a position, explain what it is, what it aims to do. Then, because this was said at a public hearing, you explain what that person is, but then you provide context on why that isn't accurate. That goes, you know, we can just present the information and the facts we can, you know, and provide some context, you know, this harkens back to, you know, whether masks are accurate or whether you should wear masks or not. The effectiveness is that we would prevent 
you know, we cover this event at this group, they're saying you shouldn't wear masks. But we counter that with facts from the CDC. And hopefully people will understand and get the truth from that. But again, you can't change someone's mind, but what you can do is provide them accurate information. But, but, but John, in, in, that, in that instance, right, if people are disinclined to believe that the CDC is going to tell us the truth about masks, it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, so th that's one issue Sassy brings up, obviously, the masking versus uh, unmasking debate, critical race theory is another, QAnon theories are another. This has been a big part of your life over the course of the last year or so. <laughs> yes, it has. Um, let's be clear about one thing, just because I, I have to say this very clearly. Critical race theory is not being taught in American high schools, middle schools, or elementary schools, right? It's just not. Um, the problem is, this is the, this is, and this is a fundamental problem that applies to critical race theory, about vaccines, about the 2020 election, about mask efficacy, the, the origins of COVID-19, pick one. Um, you have people who are getting their information from reputable sources of news that follow the standards of quality journalism, right? They are getting that verified factual information from reputable multiple quality sources. Then you have people who are getting their information from uh, places such as telegram channels and uh, rumble videos and, and gab and parlor um, and ex you know politically extreme blogs. Um, and they are being told things that are fundamentally a not true. Uh, they are extreme political propaganda. Um, and they're distorting the conversation by spreading just falsehood after falsehood. So people are feeling threatened that somehow this indoctrination is going to be happening in our schools. When in reality, what what educators are trying to do is to be, have more culturally responsive education, um, to be more respectful of the diversity of of their students and their communities in this country as a whole, um, but also to recognize that what a lot of adults think of as American history was very heavily biased and exclusionary of, of whole areas of, of American history and, you know, very whitewashed in important ways. And so we have this like, you know, this golden age perception of what history education was supposed to be and what we're supposed to teach in history classrooms, and and this is this is a huge problem that we can't confront the truths of our history um, and learn ways to have culturally responsive education so students see their histories in what they're learning. When so many people, their protests and their 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 opposition is based off of misinformation and conspiracy theories that are being spread by bad actors who are deliberately trying to sow divisions. And Sassy, this gets back to something that I know that is is a, a particular interest of yours and a passion of yours is is the flip side of this, making sure that people in traditionally underserved communities, minority communities in this country, actually feel as though the media is representing them and that they can trust what is being said as well. That's a huge barrier too in terms of getting a larger percentage of the American people to trust what we're saying is the truth. How, how do we do a better job of that? Well, that's the reason uh, that I got into journalism, right? I'm a, a, you know, a Latina girl, poor, grew up in the Bronx, and everything that I saw or read said that people like me are basically up to no good, committing crimes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why was that? And I just figured it out. For me, it was because of how we were covering our community. So I wanted to be a part of that. At the day we formed a diversity advisory committee, we also have an outside advisory committee where we have a diverse group of, of members of the community, um, a lot of minority members of the community to help guide our coverage. We are also vetting our sources, right? It's so easy to go to the same, no offense, white sources over and over and over again we are vetting our sources and auditing our sources to make sure we are presenting diverse voices. We wanna make sure we cover community events, not just the minority community when something bad happens, right? Because that's, that's why they don't trust us. You only come to my neighborhood when someone gets shot. Well, how come you don't go to my neighborhood when you know, this person won an award or they you know, saved a life or did something you know, good? We have to say, we're gonna be there for you no matter what. 
at the day, we are making a very concerted effort to hire more minority reporters, minority re uh, report, uh, copy editors, because you know what? You need to start from the inside to really start spreading from the outside. You, it has to be changed within the institutions as well. So like that, you can better cover your community and you can gain that trust. Marie, do you have a quick thought to pick up on that? No, nothing. It's that I think that you know what, what the day is doing is terrific. I actually talk with them in their diversity committee, um, and it's the same at UConn. You know, part of what part of our mission at UConn is to make sure that students, no matter what their background, is that they make an effort to talk to people who are unlike them as part of their experience, because that's what a journalist does. So, but that includes, you know, if we have students of color realizing like Sassy that they want to be part of the media because the way that they have been covered in the past does not reflect what they know that they're able to you know pitch stories about their communities and realizing that there is there's something to be said about seeing yourself mirrored back in 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 that product you're more likely to, to want to engage with it and you are more likely to trust it um, and so that's why you see so many people wanting to use social media. And, and certainly social media it can be terrible, as we know, but it can also be used for good, where these communities can come together. And you know, certain news events that have become quite large and in our and in our consciousness have happened because of, you know, basically people getting together on social media and drawing attention to it. So, you know, I don't blame the technology. You know, you can blame human nature more so because it just amplifies everything that we are and archives it and makes it searchable. Um, but hopefully, you know, there's, there's a balance there. So, you know, I, I am in full support of, you know, diversifying newsrooms um, and coverage and hopefully gaining more trust. We have just a minute left, and I just want to get to a couple, maybe a quick rapid fire questions. John asks, how do we rein in disreputable news sources or at least teach people how to distinguish between reputable and disreputable? Is there a role here for Wikipedia or some other neutral media organization to rate media sources and stories? And John, we've gotten a couple different questions like this about is there is there some way to fact check or, or have a, a source that we can go to that says, aha, this is the truth? Um, I will say that you need to learn how to Google like a pro. Um, we have a resource on our website at newslet.org called Six Steps to Learn How to Google Like a Pro. Um, open up a browser tab and just search for some details and, and, and verify. You can usually verify something within 20 seconds. Within 20 seconds? Yeah, depending on what you're searching. Chances are, it, it, chances are a, a 20 to 30 second Google search will tell you a, a lot about the credibility of information in the source. Uh, we got another question here. Our friend Kate Ferris says it has to be hard, though, Sassy and Marie, with cutbacks in newsrooms to continue to make sure all stories have the proper context. How do you have the time to provide the context with limited staff? Do you have to choose to do fewer stories? Marie, I'll ask you this first. I mean, this is a, a huge problem for newspapers like your former paper, The Current, which has been shedding reporters just left and right over the course of the last decade. How do you do this work at this level when you have fewer reporters and editors? Well, that's the thing. I think you do have to pick and choose. Um, and so you have to make smart decisions. You think about the things that affect the most people, sort of all those things that, you know, in terms of news judgment, like how many people are affected? What's the, you know, what's the timeliness of the issue? Um, you know, how, how, how much do you, work needs to be done to get there? How, how many people is it going to affect? So all of those things go into the story, but then also, you know, is it a weird story? Is it a really good story? Is it going to get, you know, is it, is it worthy of attention? Um, and so, and asking the community, what do you want us to cover? I think if there's a lot more dialogue, then you can point your coverage in the right direction, not just be like, oh, maybe this would make a good story. No, a whole bunch of people asked this question, they want this question answered. And I know that the day has been doing that, asking, asking the community that question, what do you want us to cover? And, and Sassy, I'll give you the last word on this. It's, it's got to be hard to do this, but it's something that is, is clearly in your mandate. It's what you're trying to do every day. Yes, I, I kind of joke and say that we're doing God's work because we're trying to provide information to people as best as we can, because, you know, you have to be informed. If you want to know what's going on in your community, if you want to know why your, your school budget's being, your school's being closed, you have to be informed. And we try to inform people as best as we can. But like Marie said, we are making those decisions. We can't be cover everything like we used to, but we try to cover things wisely. We try to re regionalize um, issues. So like that we can get like more bang for our buck, if you will, so like that we can, you know, spread information, you know, 
to wider groups of audiences, but it is, it is a struggle. You know, being in this industry today, it is hard, especially when you are being attacked for being fake or being called a rag, but it, it kind of like motivates me and motivates the newsroom because we are know that we are providing a, sort, a service. We are helping um, continue democracy because what happens if no one's shining a light? People get away with doing very bad stuff. And thanks to the work of honest, hardworking journalists, we uncover and expose injustices. So I feel like we have to keep on fighting the fight. Hmm. That's a good way to end. Uh, Sassy Marie, John, thank you all so very much for spending some time. I know John in the chat field, he put up uh, some links to the News Literacy Project. There's a lot of great information there. I, I really encourage people to go there and to learn how to Google like a pro, but also to learn just a little bit more in terms of how you can get information to people who might have a hard time navigating truth in a changing media landscape. Thank you all so much for your time. I do appreciate it. If you go to ctmirror.org slash events, that's where you can find some of our past conversations. It's where you can sign up for our conversation with Linda Greenhouse that's coming up next Tuesday night, a really uh, fascinating reporter who has all sorts of interesting stories about what happens during the Supreme Court term. Hopefully you can join us for that conversation. And before I go, I should say in the upper right corner uh, at the Connecticut Mirror page, ctmirror.org, there's a little donate button. It's a little red brick. And if you click on that button, you can support this paper directly. The work that the Connecticut Mirror does, it's driven by community support. That's how we're able to do this independent journalism. Just like you need to subscribe to the Day of New London, and I encourage you to subscribe to the Day of New London. I encourage you to subscribe in a way to the mirror by going to ctmirror.org and just click on donate and making a donation to help keep us alive. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Stay safe and keep cool. And we'll talk to you soon.